This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode, alongside my co host Bob Pastorella, we chat with masters of horror about writing, life lessons, creativity, and much more. Now, today's guest is Richard Chismar. He is a New York Times, USA Today, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Amazon, and Publishers Weekly best-selling author. He is the co-author with Stephen King of the best-selling novella Gwenda's Buttonbox, and the founder and publisher of Cemetery Dance Magazine, and the Cemetery Dance Publications book imprint. And in addition to having put out a load of anthologies and short fiction, coming up this summer... Is the debut novel, Chasing the Boogeyman. And we get into that in this conversation. We also talk about various collaborations that Richard has had with Stephen King. We talk about the third Gwendy book. Talk about advice that Richard would give to his 18-year-old self. So many good things coming up. But before any of that, a little bit of an advert break. It was as if the video had unzipped my skin, slunk inside my tapered flesh, and become one with me. From the creator of This Is Horror comes a new nightmare for the digital age, The Girl in the Video by Michael David Wilson. After a teacher receives a weirdly arousing video, his life descends into paranoia and obsession. More videos follow, each containing information no stranger could possibly know. But who's sending them, and what do they want? The answers may destroy everything and everyone he loves. The girl in the video is the ring meets fatal attraction for the iPhone generation. Available now in paperback, ebook, and audio. From the host of This Is Horror Podcast comes a dark thriller of obsession, paranoia, and voyeurism. After relocating to a small coastal town, Brian discovers a hole that gazes into his neighbor's bedroom. Every night she dances and he peeps. Same song, same time, same wild and mesmerizing dance. But soon Brian suspects he's not the only one watching and she's not the only one being watched. Their watching is the Wicker Man meets Body Double with a splash of Suspiria. They're Watching by Michael David Wilson and Bob Pastorella is available from thisishorror.co.uk, Amazon, and wherever good books are sold. Okay, well, with that said, here it is. It is Richard Chisma on This Is Horror. Richard, welcome back to This Is Horror. Thanks for having me back, guys. It's been a couple of years since we last spoke with you, so I wonder... In that time, what have been some of the biggest changes for you, both personally and professionally? Oh, um, personally, not too much has been different other than, you know, what's going on with the rest of the world. And and that's, you know, the pandemic. And that has been a major change. But, uh, you know, honestly, for me, I I, I don't get out much anyway. So other than just, you know, taking the, uh, the necessary precautions that everyone else is doing and and just the sadness that goes along with, with, uh, what's happening, you know, personally, you know, life has been pretty much the same. I mean, professionally, um, I'm trying to think, when did we talk last a couple of years ago? Yeah. About yeah. Windy time, you think? Yeah. It, it was almost two years to the day. Yeah. So, I mean, I, there was another Gwendy book came out and, uh, what else? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's all been a blur, actually. Ever, you know, since that first uh, Gwendy book came out, it's kind of been a, a roller coaster ride. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's remarkable that I mean, last time you just had the the first Gwendy book out. Now you've got Gwendy's Magic Feather, and I know that you're working on the third, and it's going to be a full novel alongside Stephen King. Yeah, yeah, the third one we uh, we actually just recently finished. Um, we've been working on it for a while when I first talked about it. Um, and 
and just kind of kept it kept it under the rug. And uh, we recently finished uh, as of about two weeks ago. It's uh, we still have some some tweaking to do, but it's yeah, it's a full length novel. Um, had a blast working with Steve again, and um, yeah, I mean, looking forward for to, you know everyone having a chance to uh, to read it. We're trying to figure out scheduling now. Um, he has a busy next year with two books coming out. Um, so most likely we're going to be looking at the very, very beginning of 2022. Mm. What, what did the collaboration process look like this time around? Because I remember with the first Gwendy book, it was a case of Steve had the idea and then he sent it to you and then you know you, you offered some ways that you could change it and then ultimately started writing and working on it so it was quite a unique approach to the collaboration but i wonder was this one a little different um you know the first one he sent me those first 20 pages that he had finished and, and that were just kind of sitting around and, and we went from there um whereas yeah this one we kind of started from scratch we were texting one weekend and uh, he uh, this time it was Steve who, who kind of had the idea and he uh, he uh, you know he threw a little uh, tidbits he dangled a little bit of uh, the plot idea in front of me and then I picked that up and kind of ran with it and then we just said yeah I mean he was you know once he his plate was a little clean and uh, I cleared off my schedule at the very end of the summer we got to work and um, like I said we kind of kept it quiet for a while um and uh yeah we just traded big sections of page you know page count back and forth and you know i uh, he would rewrite what i had sent him and then continue on and then he would send it to me and believe it or not i found myself rewriting part of what he would write and then we would trade it and we would just go back and forth um you know no no set rules just uh you know every once in a while we kind of gave an idea of uh, what we thought was coming next but it wasn't written in stone it was just our idea um but the other person had complete freedom to to run with whatever they wanted and uh it was a lot of fun i mean it was uh you know i, I found myself texting him several times just talking about how much fun it was because we it was it was almost like playing this game of creative ping pong where he would write something and then uh you know, in some cases, I, I, he wasn't exactly sure what came next, and he was just leaving that up to me to, to figure out. And I, I certainly know there was a couple times when I sent him my section. I didn't have a clue what came next, but it was just kind of uh, a great feeling to know that it was, you know, Stephen King on the other end who had to figure it out for us. <laughs> so you like that kind of flying without the, uh, I guess, flying without a net, huh? <laughs> well, that's, you know, it's funny because he did. Uh, you know, I'm not speaking out of turn by saying this. In the very beginning, he, uh, and, and whether it was in an email or a text, I don't remember, but he, he kind of just chuckled over, you know, in, 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 in the written word, he kind of chuckled and said, you're flying blind with me here, Rich. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, like, I, I like how he does that. He kind of just uh, has the confidence and dives in and goes, and, and we'll figure it out along the way. Um, you know, for me personally, it's a whole lot less scarier doing that when you have, you know, Steve King as your partner, that's for sure. Um, but yeah, we had a lot of fun and uh, I, I know he had fun too. And every once in a while, we kind of just checked in on each other and, and made sure that, uh, you know, there were no frustrations or anything like that. And uh, yeah, it was completely painless and, and just a blast. That's very cool. Yeah, it sounds amazing. And as you say, kind of a creative ping pong. So you're writing, but you're almost playing a game and trying to figure out what the other one might do next. And I, I guess that's the good thing about pantsing, for want of a better word, when you've got a partner, because you don't have to know what's coming next. It's like, well, I'm going to leave that to you. Uh, that's exactly right. And I mean, and, and having the freedom you know, I mean, there was a couple, and, and I can't really talk about it specifically until until the book is out, because um, I don't want to give anything away. But um, there were a couple spots where I, you know, I kind of delved into the Stephen King universe and and pulled some things out of the hat and, and threw it in there. And I and I thought after the fact, well, I wonder what he's going to think about that. And I had to go out of my way and say, Steve, if you didn't like anything I did, feel free to pull it out, do what you want. 
but to see him pick it up and run with it and be excited about it was even cooler, you know? Um, but again, yeah, I mean, you know, there's, it, it's, uh, I've collaborated with a lot of people uh, over the years and, and, and been fortunate that, uh, that it's, uh, you know, it's always been a, a fun, challenging learning, you know, learning process. Um, but I would say, yeah, that these Gwendy books and then widow's point with my son has, has been the top of that, uh, it's kind of you know been the as good as it gets for me yeah yeah and with the second Gwendy book Gwendy's Magic Feather so that was a solo project that you did but I mean did did Steve have much impetus on that Uh, input I should say or did you know you, you send him a few drafts just to to see how how he was feeling about it or was it a case of you were just riding that one solo well, what's funny is, and I've told this story a couple times now, um, and uh, every time I tell it, I just shake my head because it, 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 it's almost hard to believe, but I promise it's true. Um, you know, the way the second book came about is I, I woke up one morning and I just had this really clear picture in my head of what Gwendy Peterson had been doing over the next 15 years of her life. I, you know, there was, uh, it, it, uh, it just came to me. And, uh, with no, no intention to pitch a sequel with no intention to say, Hey, Steve, let's do this or let me do it. I, I woke up early one morning and I emailed him and I said, Hey, this is what I think Wendy's been doing for the last 15 years. And he wrote me right back that same morning. And he said, Rich, this is a brilliant idea. You should write it. So I took that as Rich, you should write the first draft and I will come on board later and, uh, and do my thing and, and make you look really good. And we'll have another, you know, volume two of Wendy, um, written by the both of us. So that's, that's how I took it. And, um, you know, obviously looking back, I should have clarified, but, uh, I, I do remember, I said, Steve, are you sure? You know, and, and I do remember saying something like, you know, we'll make sure that, you know, that whenever I get it to you, just take your time. There's no rush. So I, I do think it was on both of us a little bit, but the bottom line is, is I ran with it. I wrote, um, you know, what amounts to a long novella or a short novel and, uh, you know, set the, the bulk of it, 90% of it in Castle Rock. I, I brought, you know, I kind of brought the town back after, uh, after needful things when it was destroyed you know, there, Castle Rock has had, had not been written about since then. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I kind of did that and I brought back some, some of his, uh, really beloved Castle Rock characters like Norris Ridgewick, the sheriff, uh, the new sheriff. And, uh, and I sent it to Steve and I thought, and I said, just, you know, take your time whenever you have time to work on it, you know, I'm sure you'll uh, make it better. And, uh, Steve read it and he wrote me back and he said, no, Rich, this one's all you. Um, you know, I'm still busy, um, but if you want, I'll edit it. So after I kind of picked up, you know, my jaw off the floor, <laughs> you know, I wrote them and I could see, I said, uh, you know, I never would have uh, been ballsy enough to write about Castle Rock like this and to, you know, write about your characters and your universe. And uh, if I had known, you know, we weren't doing this together. And I just said, you know, it's important to me that you know that and, um, you know, whatever you want to do is fine but are you sure? Cause I'll wait, you know, it doesn't matter how long he wrote back and he just said, absolutely. He said, if you want to, if you want, I'll print it out and I'll do an edit on it and, um, you know, and send it back to you. But, uh, that's, that would be the extent of it. So of course I said, yes. And thank you. And, uh, that's kind of how it happened. I, you know, it, one of those cases where, uh, I'm not too bright and I just thought one thing was happening when something else was happening. And, uh, but yeah, having Steve edit me and, uh, you know, that was a really cool process. And, you know, I have his hand marked up pages sitting in an envelope here in my desk and that's something I'll keep forever. And, um, and then he wrote a wonderful introduction to kind of make sure that the, that the constant readers out there didn't think that I was running renegade and, and, and doing this without Steve's okay. So, yeah, I mean, it worked out really well. And, uh, and actually the, the fact that there was a sequel is what led to Simon and Schuster coming back to us and asking, can we make this a trilogy? You know, if, if, if we can tell people that there's, 
that it will be a trilogy. We can really do some unique marketing things. And, and uh, Steve was okay with that. So, you know, at that point, we knew there would be a book three eventually. We just didn't know whether it would be just me or, or just Steve or the two of us together. Yeah, that's such a great and that must have been a surreal experience. But I mean, it, it's probably good that you didn't know that you were running solo because you might not have taken some of those chances or you might have been a little bit more conservative in terms of Steve's universe and Castle Rock. So I, I think it worked out pretty well. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, big, big time on both, uh, both of those points. I would have been more conservative. And I would have been, uh, I would have been terrified. I mean, I was terrified with the first one in the beginning and then that went away, but uh, it it would not have went away this time because I just would have felt like, uh, you know, I'm playing in Steve's sandbox and um, even though he's okay with it, it, yeah, it just would have been a completely different mindset. So I think you're right. I think the fact that I didn't really realize that, uh, you know, the entire writing time um, just allowed me to kind of do my thing and, and uh yeah and and it worked out and and you know what an honor to to go back to castle rock like that and um you know bring it back from the dead yeah yeah and you mentioned collaborating on widow's point with your son billy and that was something that we spoke a little bit about last time but i believe last time the film adaptation was in the works and of course now it is available so i mean i'd love it if you could talk us through a little bit about that and your reaction now that you've seen the finished product so i mean how's that working out for both of you uh you know what it's it's doing well i just uh we just got the, a cover for a, a russian version of the dvd and i guess there's going to be a, a theatrical release uh maybe in russia or maybe it was somewhere else over there i'm not sure um but, uh, but yeah, you know, I mean, we, you know, we went, Billy and I went out to set for, a, for a week, uh, or for four or five days and, uh, and really enjoyed ourselves and, uh, got to know, you know, the crew and the actors and, um, you know, Billy had a, had a little bit part. He, he was, he was in uh, a short scene in the movie. So that was fun. And, uh, you know, Greg Emerson, who wrote the script and directed, you know, I thought he did a great job. You know, he did it on a very limited budget. Um, I, I think, you know. I think if you triple or quadruple the budget, you know, it's a different film. Um, but with the, uh, the funding that he had to work with, I thought he did a great job. It's, it's, uh, you know what, it's cheesy in parts, which, which I always tell people, I'm like, you know what, I grew up on those films and, and, you know, the, uh, the kind of cheesy horror films. And there are spots where it definitely has that, um, you know, but, uh, I think it's a lot of fun and, and I'm proud of the work they did. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, I, like I probably said the first time, you know, I, I, as cool as it was working with Stephen King and, and as absolutely, you know, kind of dream shattering as that was, to, to then follow that up and, and write a, a novella with my son and then have that turn into a movie and, and you know, all while he's, you know, 21 years of age or whatever, right. that's, that's, uh, that's pretty special and, uh, and something I'll never forget, so... I'm looking forward, you know, Billy and I still have plans to do a, a sequel and a prequel to, to Widow's Point. So he, uh, he's been busy with school, but uh, there's, he has a break coming up and then he'll graduate in the spring. So sooner than later, we'll be, we'll be jumping on those projects. Uh, that is exciting to hear. So, I mean, we're, we're looking mm-hmm. forward to that and we're looking forward to seeing you know, what what happens with Billy in general, what solo works he's putting out. I mean, we hope that, you know, that's going to happen too. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, it, it, during a summer break last year, before his senior year in college, he, uh, he wrote a first draft of a novel, which he's editing now. Um, I still haven't had a chance to read it. He said over at, when he finished the next draft, he thinks it'll be ready for me to read, which I'm looking forward to. Um, and uh, I know he's still, you know, he has a couple film projects floating around. We wrote a, we wrote a, a script together. We we took uh, Billy had directed a short film based on a, an idea and an outline that Steve King and I had written called Traps, and he had directed a short film which, right before the pandemic hit, was accepted into all these conventions or, or festivals rather. And then, uh, you know, with the exception of the online ones, you know, of course, none of these festivals really really happened. Um, so one day we'll have to do something a little bit more with that, the short version, cause it turned out really well. Um, 
but uh, we actually ended up expanding that into a full length feature script with Mark Pavia, who is the, the gentleman who directed uh, Kings of the Night Flyer and uh, our recent film called Fender Bender, which was a lot of fun. And uh, Mark wants to direct that. And uh, right now we've, you know, it's out there uh, to a bunch of people. Um, you know, we've got uh, a chunk of the funding in place and we're just looking for the rest right now. And uh, so hopefully that's something that Mark will be directing in uh in 2021 but yeah billy billy has a lot of billy has a lot of irons in the fire I'm, i look forward to sitting right alongside you kind of watching what happens next yeah yeah definitely well i mean one of the big things that has happened for you and that we're particularly looking forward to is chasing the boogeyman so that will be coming out summer of next year so could you tell us a little bit about this and how the deal came about um you know it's funny i sat down i i had some discussions after gwendy too with my agent um kristen nelson who was a wonderful lady really has been really good to me and um we had some conversations about what would be next and I sent a couple ideas and we kind of, you know, I hadn't had an agent in years, um, but with, when Gwendy rolled around, I, I knew it was time. So it was just an interesting process to kind of have someone there, um, you know, to kind of sound ideas off and, and decide, you know, what's next, because really I, you know, with the exception of Billy, I don't really do that. Um, so anyway, we, we, you know, we kind of had this idea of what I was going to do next and then, pandemic hit and uh you know like i said my life didn't change too much because i don't really get out that much i'm i'm not the most social of, of people i i tend to hang around with a small group and and my family and um mostly at home writing and reading and and, and fishing and that kind of thing so but anyway long story short is the pandemic hit and i you know whatever it just changed my mindset and uh without even really really realizing i was doing it i kind of pushed that stuff aside and i started working on this idea um, you know, kind of hearkening back to when I was younger. And, and what it was is when I graduated from college, um, I actually moved home to the house I grew up in. And I lived there for about six months um, while I was engaged at the time, um, while Kara, my, my fiance, was uh, finishing up school and we were going to get married after then. So the whole point was, is why go get an apartment and spend money when I can just go live at home for six months and then we'll get married and we'll you know, we'll have a place together. Um, so it was just a very interesting time in my life. Like I said, I graduated, I was writing and submitting short stories and I had just started the magazine. I was working on the first issue. Um, so kind of everything was out there in front of me and, and everything was very uncertain and, um, just a very interesting time. And to kind of move back home into my old bedroom and have my old, you know, that looked out over the side yard where I always played as a kid with my friends and, it just put my mind in this really interesting place. And um, those six months were really memorable to me. And something that was going on in my hometown during that time was that there was, there was something, there was a, a mysterious uh, intruder who was breaking into homes and the news, the newspaper coined the phrase, the phantom fondler, because this guy would break into homes in the town where I lived in and he would just touch women's hair or he would touch their feet. And w when they were sleeping and when they woke up, he would take off running into the night. And he had done this to like 20 different women. And so, so it was just an interesting time. You know, the town was kind of on high alert and, you know, people were locking their windows and getting security systems. And, you know, the police were looking for this guy. And, and there was always the fear that, you know, maybe he could kind of, uh, you know, progress to doing something more than just touching and, and, and you know, worse things could happen. Um, so I found myself thinking about this time period and I just start, started writing this story with myself as you know one of the main characters you know and and it followed real life and my parents were characters and Kara was a character and and uh and but instead of the phantom fondler you know I, something worse was happening and and i just kind of let my imagination run with it and um yeah so somehow i ended up with this bizarre story you know kind of like stepping into a time machine and um it's very autobiographical um, the character is, is me. The character is Rich Chismar and he's working on Cemetery Dance Magazine and <laughs> he's dreaming of one day publishing Stephen King and, uh, one day selling, you know, short stories and the whole thing. And, um, I get mixed up in this real life 
uh, you know, mystery with this serial killer and I uh, end up becoming a part of the story. And uh, like I said, it's very autobiographical. It was a lot of fun to write about my family and my friends and, and life and, um, and mix it up with, uh, with, you know, this, what I'm purporting to be a true crime. I'm a huge fan of true crime books and true crime, uh, you know, television programs. And uh, when I sat down to write it, that was what the idea was, is that I was going to write this down as a, uh, you know, in, in the format of a true crime book. And I went out and I took pictures of the uh, crime scenes and I went out and, and uh, you know, took pictures. Uh, I, I created with, with help from others, you know, roadside memorials of where one of the killings took place and took pictures. And I, uh, I asked my friends if I could borrow their daughters as, uh, as victims and, and we took pictures and, um, it's, uh, it's an interesting project. I, you know, I knew it would either be very much embraced or people would look at me and think I was crazy. So I, I think I got lucky. Yeah, and it sounds like this is definitely going to be one of those releases where you want to pick up the physical copy of the release with all those kind of extras and those photographs. I feel that, you know, if you've got the electronic copy, even though that will be decent, you're going to be missing something and similarly with the audio book. Yeah, definitely with the audio book. I'm not sure how they're going to do that. Um, you know, with the ebook, they'll be able to, to slap the pictures right in there, but but yeah, I just, like I said, I, it, it's funny because as so often is the case with me, um, it just goes to show, you know, when I do sit down and try to create this master plan of what I want to do, I, you know, I end up throwing it out the window and, and doing my own thing anyway. Um, but that was kind of the beauty of it is I, I really wrote it for myself. Um, at times it kind of felt like this self-indulgent project because it was, you know, so true to life and and but just really you know a, a lot of fun despite the dark subject matter i mean the uh you know being able to you know i really respect the people who write these the real journalists who write these true crime books and do this metic meticulous you know research and investigation because there's so many little uh you know nuts and bolts to cover and so many little cobwebby corners to sweep out for information and uh you know, when you're doing a fictitious version, you can just make it up, you know, you, you know, obviously it has to be smart and it has the pieces have to fit, but it's a whole lot easier when you really need something to pull it from your hat when you're just making it up. Um, but yeah, it's, it, uh, from start to finish, it was a blast and it, it was a really quick process. And, um, when I first told my agent about it, she was a little weary. She kind of looked at me cross-eyed and, you know, she actually, you know, said, well, if, if, if you know, an editor loves it, but wants to change the main character to not you. Are you okay with that? And I said, I think so. You know, she knows I, I'm not a, I don't go to a lot of conventions. I'm not, you know, my face isn't plastered all over the place. It, it's not about that for me. Um, it's just the way the story needed to be told this, in this case. Um, so, yeah, I mean, but, but when she finally read it, she was really pleasantly surprised and, one of the first things she told me she said okay you won me over we, we can't change it it's got to be about you and it's your town and it's your family and and uh yeah it's just you know my parents have been gone for a while yeah uh, my mom's been gone for you know almost 20 years and my dad's been gone for 13 years so you know for the three months i was working on this book i, I got to hang out with my parents every day that was that was really cool um you know, so yeah, just a lot of fun to, to kind of pull up these old memories and then twist them into a, into a, a partially true, you know, partially false and, and make believe, you know, horror story and suspense story. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to everyone, to, you know, reading it. I'm, I'm going over the, uh, the editor's notes on it now and tweaking things here and there. And, um, I'll be sending that back to him next week and I uh, can't wait until there's arcs and we start getting them out to, uh, to advance readers. Yeah, well, we're certainly very excited to read it here at This Is Horror. And I mean, I mean, I wonder, was this the first time that you'd worked on something that is metafictional? Yeah, I mean, there's there's bits and pieces. If you look in, you know, if you read the story notes from my uh, short story collections, you know, there are certainly, um, you know, times when I, uh, I talk about it in the story that's where I say, you know, I didn't realize how many, how many times I talked about Hanson Creek or weeping willow trees and, you know, certain different, uh, you know, story aspects 
that that are pulled directly from my life. You know, that I, I grew up on Hanson Road right down the street from Winters Run Creek where we always fished and, and played as kids. And, and there was a, a huge towering weeping willow tree in my side yard. And, you know, just a lot of, uh, of the smaller elements of those stories and, and some of the thematic stuff, you know, definitely came from real life. Um, but, yeah, but there, yeah, there's no story. You know, I'd never written a story where it was – directly modeled on, on a, uh, on something, um, you know, from my past. And whereas with this one, um, you know, that'll be one of the interesting things is, you know, I've had to tell all my friends, Hey, you remember when we did this, this, and this, guess what? I just wrote about it for the first time. <laughs> and, and a lot of people are going to, they're going to read it. So they're excited. Um, they're a bunch of knuckleheads like me. So they, they, you know, they're excited by, you know, the, the idea that, that our old antics are about to be uh, dragged out in public. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, but no, I, I'd never done that to this extent. I, like I said, it, it just really, you know, when I, my affection for true crime, there's always been that fascination because so much of it has to do with the human monster, the, 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 the killer next door type of thing. And uh, that has always intrigued me and has always frightened me and, and has always really made me think. And, um, so that's where the kind of the germ was of, of the story. And then, um, you know, when I think whenever I pick up a true crime book, as soon as I read about something specific, I always turn to the photo section because I want to see that person's face. Yeah. Um, you know, while I continue reading about it, I read about, you know, the first murder or this crime, I immediately turn to the photo section because I want to, I want to see it. And, um, you know, for me, it's not about the blood because, you know, a lot of these, you know, if you've looked at these books, a lot of them aren't like that. There's not, you know, they're not gory pictures. They're pictures of the victim in happier times. Um, they're pictures of the victims for their family or their friends. Um, the crime scene is, is, is a very sterile, you know, photograph, but you know, when they're talking about the desk or the base of this tree, you know, you don't have to imagine it. You can kind of see it right there. And, uh, it, it kind of adds poignancy and weight to the story. So the, the, the idea of including photographs was something that came really quickly and early in the process. And, um, I've actually positioned them at the end of each chapter, as opposed to having one photo section in the book that you have to continually turn to. Um, which is something I, I wish you would see more often, but, uh, but yeah, so yeah, it was all those kind of threads kind of weaving themselves into one. And then just the fact that there really was this, this character called the Phantom Fondler that, uh, that haunted and, and prowled around my hometown for a three or four year period that kind of, you know, I said, you know what, it, it really could have gotten worse than that. And, and that's what I did. I mean, you know, we, uh, I, I took the worst scenario and, uh, and, and made it happen and put myself right in the middle of it. And, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, you talk, it's a little bit of a roller coaster in itself. And I wish August would, would come a little quicker. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've taken writing what, you know, like cranked it up to 11, you know, and that's, yeah. I love that. I love that. It's well, it, it, yeah, I mean, you're right. And that's where the kind of the self-indulgent part came from is I just felt like in some cases I felt like this is too easy, man. Cause I'm writing about something that really happened and people are going to say that rich, come on, tell me the truth. Did this, you know, um, and, and, and some of it's looking back and it's nostalgia, like, you know, us jumping ramps as kids and us taking 22s out in the woods to go shoot at, at crows and, and just the ridiculous things that we did. And, and, uh, oftentimes, you know, mind numbingly dangerous things that we did and, 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 and being able to write about them. And then I know people are going to think that I added these uh, kind of authorly flourishes to them. And I'm just going to have to shake my head and crack up laughing and say, no, we were really that dumb. We did all these things. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I know when I, again, that was one of the cool things is, is I, you know, even after my agent, you know, called me that day and said, all right, you won me over. We really didn't know what kind of reception we would get. The, the, the handful of writers who I had sent early copies to, um, to see if they would give it promotional blurbs, everyone had been very positive. And, and the biggest, the biggest takeaway that I took from, from their kind comments, um, was with the exception of maybe one or two of them, everyone told me they read it in a day. 
And I just, for me, that that's wonderful because even though it might be rough around the corner still, and even though, you know, this plot point might be massaged a little bit and changed a little bit on a, on a you know, the, the final rewrite or whatever, if, if they can get through a 300 and something page book in a day, that means you, you told the story and you told it pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we were happy with all that. But again, when it came time to kind of send it out to an editor, we really had no idea what to expect. Um, so the reaction we got from, from Simon and Schuster, um, you know, was, was just a, you know, a wonderful surprise and, and the idea that they did, you know, that they wanted to do it to, to make a preempt offer so that no other publishers would have a chance at it was, was wonderful. And, um, you know, the, the kind of the feeling that came out of that was that, you know, Hey, whether you meant to or not, you kind of you kind of invented this new little genre here of a fictitious true crime or, or whatever the hell you want to call it. And, uh, you know, I know Brian Keene and a couple of the writers, you know, commented, they're like, Rich, you son of a bitch, you know, <laughs> you kind of do something new here. And I wish I had thought of this. And I'm like, well, that's the cool thing now is we can all do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, it's just one of those happy accidents that, that I feel very fortunate to, uh, to be a part of. Yeah. And it's, it, you know, the, the thing about it is, it's like you run across people who, you know, basically they, they say, oh, man, I don't have nothing to write about. And one of the things I always tell them is look at your town's history where you grew up. Mm -hmm. There's something there. You might not know it, but there may be someone you can talk to, you know, check with your library. Yeah. You would be surprised. Every town has that, secrets. That is absolutely true. That's absolutely true. And, uh, I just hope I hope my town of Edgewood is uh, will be pleased when it comes out. I mean, my son, <laughs> Billy, Billy was a wreck. Billy was a wreck because he's like, Dad, you actually use your real address of where you uh, you know where you grew up all those years, and you put a picture of your house in the book. And he's like, you know, the people that live there now, and I'm like, Billy. And at the time, we didn't know. I was like, Billy. I said, this book might. You know, we might be publishing this as a limited and, and maybe 500 people will read it. I said, I don't know. I said, or it could be, you know, a mainstream publisher and, and, and maybe 2000 people will read it. I said, or maybe we'll get lucky and a whole bunch of people read it. I said, but he's like, but you just can't because originally the subtitle was a, a, a true story of small town horror. It, it was, originally it was called The Boogeyman, a true story of small town horror or something like that. And uh, it was Simon and Schuster who asked me to change it to Chasing the Boogeyman because uh, they felt that it sounded a little bit more true crime-ish. And uh, uh, it also plays off uh, a phrase in the book that's used in the book, um, which I was happy to do. And uh, that that whole true crime, you know, true, you know, whatever the hell I called it, scared Billy to death. He's like, Dad, you're going to get sued. He's like, <laughs> There's sightseers at the house, or the property, the property values are going to go down. Or <laughs> he was a nervous wreck. He was like, and, and you've got to tell them these people in the picture are actors. And I'm like, really, just relax. <laughs> I, you know, I, I love the idea of it kind of being. I loved when Blair Witch came out. Yeah. I don't know if you guys remember that when it first came out, and there was a whole slew of people who were convinced that it was real. Yeah. And I love that. I, I, I loved that. And I told Billy, I said, Billy, you should actually do a, a short documentary, like a 50 or 60 minute documentary about the boogeyman killings of 1988 in Edgewood, Maryland. And I said, it'd be a great vehicle to promote the book. And it would be like this kind of cross creative, uh, you know, spider web that we could kind of continue to weave off of. And I said, we can get someone to do a website. And so he's thinking about it. Um, which is a big turn. Cause like I said, in the beginning, he was just mortified, <laughs> but, uh, but that's, yeah, I, I would like to do that. I mean, you know, even though I have an author's note at the end of the book that they requested, I put in there where I kind of spilled the beans. Um, I'm still convinced that, uh, that, that we could still pull the wool over the eyes of, of quite a few people. If we, if we did that. Yeah, I think oh, so. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, funnily enough, when you were talking about that, I was thinking about the Blair Witch Project and to a lesser extent, paranormal activity. And so when these movies came out, a number of people kind of thought either it was real or they, or they were questioning, is this real? Did this actually happen? And like, we haven't seen that too much with a book, but this is definitely 
the direction that you know you've gone in here and I mean I, I was also gonna say I think you know we, we normally talk about film or audio adaptations and they're more a straight adaptation but because of what you've done here you could either have like this documentary as you said with Billy maybe doing a 50 60 minute true in inverted commas uh, boogeyman documentary or also because of the popularity of true crime podcasts I mean maybe there's something in that as well I mean I think it would be hugely popular yeah, and you know what? And that's exactly uh, talking about the True Crime podcast is, is I don't really listen to them. Um, you know, Billy's actually right now trying to convince me into doing that kind of podcast thing, which, uh, which I may do just because, again, because it's with my son and it would be fun to do. And, and he, mm-hmm. we, we share, uh, we kind of share the same temperament. So I know it will never be, we'll, it'll never be dry and boring. You're just as likely to hear, you know, a half an hour of really interesting, you know, tidbits about cemetery dances past or inside stories and, or, you know, or another day you may hear like 10 minutes of Billy and I wrestling on the ground because he's a knucklehead and, and we, tend to be two big kids. And, and, uh, that's what I told him. I said, I just don't know if I'm ready to open that door to the public right. and, uh, and show them that side of us. And he's like, come on, dad, it'd be great. Um, so we're thinking about it, but I, I, that's, you know, I watch them on Netflix and I watch them on television and these, you know, the different crime, you know, series on HBO, true crime. And, and I read a lot of the books. Um, but I, 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 people keep telling me there's this entire world of, of true crime podcasts that are wonderful. And I need to get off my butt and, and do and listen. And that's, you know, also for marketing purposes of the book itself, I thought it'd be, that's got to be a perfect, uh, you know, audience to reach out to. Yeah. Yeah, I, I certainly think so. And I've listened to a number of true crime podcasts. I've also listened to a number of like a kind of a story podcasts, but that are presented as true crime. But I think the unique thing here is you, you you know it's metafictional so you could present it as true and people aren't going to know whether it is or isn't i mean i think it was five or so years ago there was a podcast called limetown that was similar it was presented as if this was real they didn't say at any point that it wasn't and so i think there's a massive audience there so definitely something to consider yeah well uh, you know thank mm-hmm. you for uh reinforcing that thought in my brain I, I was you know if you guys have any further ideas please uh you know <laughs> drop me an email or drop me a note because i'd love to talk about it and like i said i'm kind of uh i have an extreme interest in that um and 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 i'm definitely a veteran when it comes to the books and all that but when it comes to that podcast side i'm, I'm a i'm a rookie so I, i'd love to hear any advice that you guys have to throw my way yeah and that, there's a guy called john grills who did a podcast called small town horror and he now runs creepy pod which i believe is on the bloody disgusting network and so he would be a great person to talk to about this i don't know if i can kind of drop him a line and see if he wants to chat with you and then on the other side on the more fictional side of things you might want to talk to david cummings of no sleep podcast but if, if you get the expertise of both of them then you'll be in pretty safe hands okay well yeah no, i mean i'd love any recommendations that you have and and anytime you want to you know contact someone and just say hey you might want to talk to this guy i'd love that and any any help i'd appreciate it because like i said this is kind of it's all kind of uncharted waters for me and I'm excited by it. And, uh, um, you know, I feel like, I, I feel like once these edits are done, the hard parts over and now I can just have some, some real fun with it. So I'm looking forward to that. And, um, one, one little aside that, 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 that I, you know, I really haven't talked about yet and, and I won't mention names. Um, but two of the authors who, who we sent manuscripts to and asked them to read with the idea of blurbing it, if they liked it, um, and they both came through with wonderful praise for the book. Um, and, and we're actually fortunate because there's been quite a few that, that we, that we uh, heard back from, but uh, two of the gentlemen both actually believed and, until after we discussed it after the fact that, that this really, that this was true, that this really did happen. And, and just were, were flabbergasted. The photos for them were the clinchers and they were yeah. flabbergasted that we went out and got friends, daughters and actors 
and, and had people take pictures. And, uh, you know, I, I have pictures in the book of, of a bunch of civilian searchers, you know, out strong, you know, out in this field, you know, searching the field for, for evidence. And, uh, you know, I have police detectives and uniform cops and they, uh, you know, these are two writers who, who write a, a amazing, you know, dark fiction and, and are uh, very smart guys. And the fact that, that they believed it was real, um, just tickled me to death. And, 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 uh, yeah. So I, I think that potential is definitely there. Yeah. That's so, so good. And must've been an amazing reaction for you mm-hmm. to get. <laughs> well, the, what's funny is I thought, Oh no, I said, don't get mad at me. I wasn't trying to trick you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but <laughs> because for me, you, you send a book and, and like that. And I go out of my way to say, look, I know you're busy. So if you don't have time to read it, that's fine. I said, if you don't like it, I don't expect or want a blurb, you know, just, uh, I said, you know, hell, you can just tell me you didn't have time to read it. And then, you know, feelings feelings are spared and, and, you know, the whole thing. And I said, but, you know, I don't like telling them other than that common courtesy thing. I don't really like telling you anything about it because I don't want to sway your opinion. So it's just kind of, Hey, here it is. If you get a chance, read it. If you like it, thank you. If you don't, I understand. And thank you for reading it anyway. Um, and that's that. So, it, you know, on one hand, I shouldn't feel bad because like I said, I didn't lead anybody on, but the other hand, I felt you feel terrible because you feel like, Oh my God, I did not mean to trick you. And then you kind of stop and back up a couple steps and start giggling. And you're like, but that's really cool that I did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was just, yeah, I was going to say, hopefully that uh, is something that, that, you know, we can, we can continue to play on it. And just the two of your reaction to it and the fact that you, you, uh, you know, you're really experienced with this stuff and the fact that you think it'd be, it, it'd be cool to explore that true crime podcast kind of area that, that uh, gives me uh, a lot of uh, enthusiasm to do that. Oh uh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm very excited about it both from, you know, a, a kind of commercial point of view for you, but also from a selfish point of view that I want to hear that, you know, this is something I want to listen to. So yeah, I, mm-hmm. I, I'm very confident that this is a good idea and something to explore. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and like I said, usually, usually doing something like this, I, I, I don't ask the host for any help, but if you have any help, because like, like I said, I am such a rookie, I will greet it with open arms and, uh, and, uh, and listen and, and act on it. So, uh, I, I just appreciate the interest. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. And I'll, I'll be on that later this week. So don't you worry. I'll be in touch. Thank you. Yeah. I was just going to say, I'll make sure you guys get arcs too, as soon as, uh, I actually spoke to my editor the other day, and I said, when it's time to get that box of arts, I said, if I could work it out so maybe I get two boxes, um, I said, because, you know, I really want to spread this thing around, and uh, and he he agreed right away. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, having those pictures, um, particularly on things like, instagram that really does seem to like signal boost these releases and get people excited about them i mean i found that with the girl in the video earlier this year a lot of people because it was on instagram then went out and and bought the book so it's certainly yeah something to do especially with this book when there's so much that is visual about it right Right. Yeah. And I mean, and that's the thing, you know, I think the book, ha- the book has a lot of photos. I think the book has a total of, you know, maybe 50 photos. Mm. Because, like I said, they're scattered. They're scattered throughout at the end of each chapter. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, to get those 50 photos, we probably shot about 150. So we do have a lot of, uh, you know, outtakes and we do have a lot of extra kind of bonus material that we could use for other things. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, we'll look out for that kind of special limited edition maybe in years to come, the 10th anniversary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I understand as well that you have a special book club offer, so for those looking to pre-order who are part of a book club. Yeah, we just kind of, uh, again, because this seemed like the the kind of book that would really you know, cater to, to the idea of a book club, you know, reading it together and having discussions, you know, about it. And, and I did a few of these with, with, uh, the two Gwendy books mm-hmm. where, uh, you know, a couple local ones where I actually attended and, and spoke to them. And then quite a few where I did it over zoom or, uh, or Skype. 
Um, and, and I found that I actually really enjoyed it because you get, a, you know, you get a lot of, of, of various, uh, you know, viewpoints right there in the same room. And, and it usually leads to kind of a cool discussion. Um, but particularly for this one, because I know there's a lot of true crime, you know, book clubs and groups that read all kinds of different books, but also, you know, really have a, a fondness for true crime. Um, you know, I kind of, and, and then you, you couple that with the pandemic where it's, uh, you know, you know, now the libraries aren't asking me to come out and talk. They're asking me if I'll, you know, sit in front of my laptop and, 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 and do a presentation, which is, which is also nice. Um, but yeah, we just thought, you know what, there's, if they want to, if you want to get a group together and order from an Amazon or from wherever your bookstore is, you know, your local bookstore, then, you know, I can send a bunch of signed book plates. So, so everyone can have, you know, signed copies. Um, or if you want to order from my local independent store here, I can go and scribe them or, you know, or sign them, you know, flat sign them on the title page. And then for the book clubs, I kind of had this bonus chat book produced, which, uh, you know, each, you know, if there's 10 or 30 or five, you know, members of the book club, will send out that many to each member and then i'll do a zoom thing and uh and we can all talk about it so it's it's uh you know hopefully when the book comes out in august uh for this one you know i'll be able to go out there and, and do a bunch of signings and do a bunch of appearances and, and and if everything goes the way that they're saying then that should happen but i've learned not to uh to count on anything until it does happen yeah yeah We've got a question from Lucas Milliron via Patreon, and so he wants to know what has collaborating with some of the best names in horror taught you, and how does your writing process differ when working with another writer versus writing by yourself? That's a good question, actually. I, I you know, I try to not, I try to not let it differ at all. Um, you know, I try to go in with the same mindset and, um, and, and, and once I'm into a story, I do believe I'm able to achieve that because once I'm in, I'm, I've kind of surrendered to the process and, and, and I'm just, uh, you know, um, whether that sounds corny or whether it sounds, you know, kind of too artistic or whatever it's for, in my case, it's true. And, you know, and I'm not trying to, to, to be an artiste cause I might be, you know, I might be writing about like flesh eating monsters that day on horseback or something. I don't know, but so there's nothing fancy about it, but it, when I get it, when I'm, when I'm sucked into that story like that, yeah, there's, there's not a lot of thought beyond, um, you know, whether someone else is going to see it or whether someone else is going to like it. I'm just kind of at the mercy of the story and I'm writing it. Um, but as far as what I've learned, you know, the, the most interesting thing I think I've learned is just being able to see the choices that other writers make right there, almost live action a lot of times. Um, you know, uh, you know, in the case of, uh, uh, of the Gwendy books, you know, with Steven, it's been neat to, you know, I hand off a section of pages and I, and I know, you know, I kind of know what's going to happen in say the next five pages. And then I really don't know what's happening next and either does he, but it's kind of neat to see the choices that he makes in those next five pages and how it differs from what I would have done in some cases or, ha or in other cases, how it's exactly this, you know, the same choice. Um, you know, it's just fascinating to see that. And one of the things I like about collaborating, uh, particularly, again, I'm going to say with Steven is because as we do it, there's a lot of uh, texting back and forth. Um, you know, we, we tend to, to, to comment on things or ask questions back and forth on things as we're doing it. So that's what I meant when I said kind of like live action, you're kind of, you're kind of, I'm kind of part of the process and he's kind of part of the process, even when it's not our turn, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So that's neat. I mean, in that in that regard, it really is almost like we're sitting next to each other at the same desk with two different computer screens, and we're tapping each other on the shoulder and saying, "Hey, what do you think about this? I'm, I'm thinking about doing this, but you know, want to know your thought." And then other cases, we don't care. We're just like, "I don't care what you think. I'm doing it." So yeah, it, it's. Uh, but but to answer the question, I think just seeing the choices that they make and. Um, I think you also kind of feed off that sense of freedom, you know, that what they're doing, you know, they know that you have their back and that you're going to be able to pick them up. And like you talked about earlier and, and, and get them out of a jam or, uh, you know, take what it, you know, there's nothing better than when you're collaborating on something and the other person tells you, you took my scene and you make it and you made it so much better. And there's a part in Gwendy three, um, you know, obviously there's, there's numerous parts, but there's one part in particular where, you know, I wrote it. I really liked it. 
Um, I knew it would get better, you know, through further drafts. But then I went back and I read the final, you know, what is now for now the final draft. And I just, you know, picked up my phone. I texted Steve and I'm like, you made that scene so great. And, you know, to have someone of his stature, you know, text me back with, you know, big capital letters and exclamation mark and say, thank you is, uh, is a cool thing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think as well, for me personally, I enjoy the collaborative process because it's making something that is ordinarily quite a lonely and solitary pursuit and, you know, m- making it interactive. It's given you a companion for the journey. No, that, yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, what I find when I'm finished one, um, it, you, you kind of feel like, you know, I feel like texting Steve, you know, a couple of times over the last week. I miss you, man. <laughs> yeah. <Because> yeah. <laughs> for, for the previous for the previous two and a half months or three months, we've been texting back and forth all day and, and you know, or, or, or every morning or, you know, whatever. And we still do. Um, you know, he told me the other day about something he had just seen on Netflix. And then I told him about a book I had just finished reading a couple of days before that. And But it's not the same. You know, there's not that same energy level going back and forth as when you're you know, you're both, uh, you know, being swept along by the same story. So yeah, it, it does. It, it, you have that feeling of companionship and partnership and, uh, you know, that's a neat thing, especially, you know, when, you, when, you, when it's a good partnership and there's not any of those feelings of restriction or, uh, being held back. Um, that's a really good feeling. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, I know that we're coming up to the time that we have together today, but I'm wondering what advice would you give to your 18 year old self? Um, well, you know what? At, I started the magazine when I was 21 and I, I think I'd started submitting stories earlier that year, you know, much earlier that year. Um, so at that age I was kind of rolling, uh, you know, I wasn't rolling. I was struggling big time, but I was, I was on the path. You know, um, and, and, and by then, I, even from the very beginning, I knew that this was going to be my thing. And, and whether it took five years or 25 years to, to get where I wanted, I was going to keep doing it. I, you know, I, I was one of those really fortunate, stubborn people that, that had that in my pocket because I just knew, uh, you know, uh, I'm very fortunate because if, if this didn't work out, I, I don't know what the hell I'd be doing right now. Um, but uh at 18, I probably would have just, uh, you know, at 18, man, I was just, uh, I was having fun and, and I was much more interested in, in sports and girls and, and all that than, and, you know, it, it kind of took those, that the passage of those next few years for me to t- return to my storytelling roots and my love of books and all that. So at 18, I guess I would have just said, Rich, just keep doing what you're doing because you're going to be one of those lucky ones and, and uh, things are going to fall into place for you. So. Maybe that's a cop out of an answer, but uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I guess eighteen. You know, most of us are still searching. Right. Yeah. I mean, some may think it's a cop out, but I guess often when we talk about this, we think of that butterfly effect. And well, if you're kind of happy with where you are in life at the moment, then you don't want to move too many other pieces because you never know, you know, what else that would have impacted. You know what? It's funny you say that because I, I said this a couple of weeks ago in an interview and, and, and I had said it previously a few times, but not for a while. Um, but when I first started doing talks, public talks at libraries or writers conferences or those type of things, and I would kind of tell the chronological story of how Cemetery Dance came about and, and how my writing career progressed. Um, I, I still remember after the first handful of those I did, I would sit in my car kind of awestruck and also kind of terrified because I realized that in telling those stories like that, there were three or four of these just kind of benchmark moments that I realized that if this hadn't happened, this next one would have never happened. And if that one wouldn't have happened, this one would have never happened. And if those three things didn't happen, I would not be doing this. And, and just to know that with such certainty like I said, I remember in the beginning, it kind of scared me and, and, and blew me away because like you said, that butterfly effect, I just thought, my goodness, you know, how, how fortunate was I that these things fell into place when they did and where they did. 
and I was kind of ready at that point in my life, ready to receive them and, and, and do something with them because, uh, yeah, I just, uh, again, I, even now sitting here talking about it, I think, wow, you know, a few of those things didn't happen. I, I don't know what I'd be doing, you know, whether I'd be a lawyer or a school teacher or, or maybe nothing good at all. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank goodness everything that happened happened and you know, you are here and you're doing this and seems like there's a lot of exciting things on the horizon for you. And I mean, we we just can't wait for Jason the Boogeyman to come out, and we mm-hmm. wish it was August already, but it isn't. So you know, eight months yeah. or so, and we'll, we'll be well, ready I'll to get, read it. I'll get to you guys early. Okay, I'll get to you guys early. Yeah. I'll make sure I send you a couple of galleys and um, and take care of you. And uh, so I'll be anxious to hear what you think. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Oh yeah. Well, where can our listeners connect with you? Um. You know what? I'm on all the different social media things. I, I uh, you know, Facebook, I, I think, um, you know, uh, I think they have like a 5,000 person limit because I was not smart enough to do like an author's page. Um, although a very nice lady uh, um, named Danielle did do a, a fan page. So I think that can have as many people connected to it as possible. But uh, I'm, I'm really active on Twitter. You know, I just I actually just tweeted out a, a giveaway for a, for a, a couple two hundred and fifty dollars some material dance gift certificates that I'll pick winners for next week. And I have a lot of fun on Twitter. I post it on Instagram. So yeah, they can they can follow me on any of those. And uh, and uh, you know, like I said, I'm very interactive and, and enjoy doing it. All right. Well, do you have any final thoughts to leave our listeners with? Um, you know, not really. Like you said, it's, it's, uh, it's an exciting time right now. Um, I'm very grateful to be doing what I'm doing and, uh, you know, uh, just going to keep doing my thing and, uh, just, I hope everyone out there stays safe and stays well and, um, love to hear from you. And, uh, I thank you guys for having me on again. And, uh, I really look forward to sending you boogeyman and, and seeing your thoughts on it. Thank you so much for listening to Richard Chismar on This Is Horror. Join us again next time when we will be chatting with Raph James White. But if you want to get that ahead of the crowd, if you want to get every episode ahead of the crowd, then become our patron at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. You get early bird access to each and every episode. You get Story Unboxed, the horror podcast on the craft of writing. You get the video cast on camera off record. You get access to the writers forum on Discord. And you get the patrons only Q&A sessions with myself and Bob Pastorella. So plenty of reasons to join us. Go to patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Check it out and see if it's a good fit for you. Okay, before I wrap up, a little bit of an advert break. From the host of This Is Horror Podcast comes a dark thriller of obsession, paranoia, and voyeurism. After relocating to a small coastal town, Brian discovers a hole that gazes into his neighbor's bedroom. Every night she dances and he peeps. Same song, same time, same wild and mesmerizing dance. But soon Brian suspects he's not the only one watching and she's not the only one being watched. They're watching as the Wicker Man meets Body Double with a splash of Suspiria. They're watching by Michael David Wilson and Bob Pastorella is available from thisishorror.co.uk, Amazon, and wherever good books are sold. It was as if the video had unzipped my skin, slunk inside my tapered flesh, and become one with me. From the creator of This Is Horror comes a new nightmare for the digital age, The Girl in the Video by Michael David Wilson. After a teacher receives a weirdly arousing video, his life descends into paranoia and obsession. More videos follow, each containing information no stranger could possibly know. But who's sending them, and what do they want? The answers may destroy everything and everyone he loves. The girl in the video is The Ring Meets Fatal Attraction for the iPhone Generation. Available now in paperback, ebook, and audio. Well, that about does it for another episode. And as I always say, and as I will say very shortly in the outro, be kind to yourselves. Because we are all imperfect humans. We're all a little bit fucked up. We're all works in progress. But slowly but surely, we are trying to get better. 
We are striving to be better people, to be better writers, to be better friends, perhaps a better lover, a better husband, a better wife. But we are imperfect. That's how it goes. And we should love ourselves and love each other in spite of the imperfections, maybe because of them, you know, embrace our flawedness of human beings. So do be kind to yourselves. So on that note, take care of yourselves, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day. This is Horror Podcast.